good thing to report. Uh, if you look up at the slide, you can see we've got Ephesus checked off, Smyrna checked off. Um, we had uh, uh, Pergamus checked off. And we've checked off Thyatira, which means, what me, What does that mean? We're going into Sardis. And uh, George only knew that because he saw the arrow. No, I know that you knew what was next, but there is an arrow up there that points to Sardis. Uh, we're going to have a... Uh, a few words to say right here at the beginning about Thyatira because I want to roll from Thyatira into Sardis. And there's a few things I, di I don't believe I brought up about Thyatira and to really uh, to, to close it off here. And um, so we're talking about dispensations of the church. So I'm going to uh, start reading in Thyatira. We're not going to spend a lot of time in Thyatira because I want to plunge, uh, go, go forward and, um, and get into Sardis here. And uh, we'll spend most of our time talking about Sardis. And I, I have a lot of good things that the Lord has given me. So um, I, I just uh, I pray that we can get through uh, as much of this as possible. Okay, so let's read here. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I'm not going to comment on everything here. We spent a lot of time. We spent more time in Thyatira than any of the churches. So we're going to keep going here. I, but I will make comments um, uh, coming up here. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. We've heard a lot about Jezebel. We don't like Jezebel. How many like Jezebel? Good. That's that. You're learning. You're you're getting what I wanted. Jezebel is not good. Okay. Uh, they suffer this. They suffer this, this woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophet, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I don't know how you can read this without understanding that these are not good things. Stay away from this creature, this person by the name of Jezebel. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Ooh, isn't she beautiful with that cup in her hand? And by the way, that's not wine that was pouring out, being poured out. That was the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, if you'll read uh, Revelation 17. But behold, I will cast her, and here's what I want to, I want to emphasize here. Behold, I will, I, the Lord Jesus, I will cast her into a bed of suffering, of sickness and suffering, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. How many heard there's going to be a great tribulation? This is the only, this is the only church so far that was told, you're going headed straight for the great tribulation. Which, you know what, if he's saying to one of the church dispensations that some, some are headed straight for the Great Tribulation, you know what the alternative is? Going up in a rapture. Yep. So right here, you know, you could flip a coin. One, one time the Lord revealed something very easy to me. To me, it was very significant. He showed me a coin. He said, my word, he showed me, I think it was a nickel. And he showed me a nickel. I'm like, well, what is it, a nickel? And uh, maybe it was, it, it might have been a quarter, but it um, been a long time ago. But, but he says, uh, this is my word to my people. And it was a coin. Now look at it. Uh, what do you mean this is your word to your people? And he said, turn it around and see the other side. And all of a sudden I realized they only see the one side, and there's much more to it, to turn it around. There's always something, when the, when the Word of God says something, there's always the other side of it. See? So turn it around. If he's talking about these people are headed for the Great Tribulation, there's other people that are headed not for the Great Tribulation. And that's something to say, praise the Lord. Because we want to be headed not in the Great Tribulation, right? But some people, yes, indeed, some people in the church are headed for the Great Tribulation. That's, right. That's bad news for some people. Yes. But the good news for us is not everybody's headed for the Great Tribulation, praise God. Some are escaping. Anyway, to this dispensation, he says, 
that he's going to throw them, he's going to cause uh, sickness and suffering and throw her in the great tribulation of intense suffering, except they repent of their deeds. Notice the exception. You can get out of it, but repentance is necessary. And watch this next thing. I will kill her children with death, with pestilence, and thoroughly exterminate them. How many heard about the four horsemen coming up? We're, we haven't gotten there yet. Four horsemen. Some of that has to do with sickness and death and pestilence, and that's what he's talking about. It all has to do with the tribulation. And, and uh, all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And uh, we have a couple of scriptures here from, uh, from uh, looks like they're all from Corinthians. And, um, uh, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial, of course, is uh, uh, Satan, another name for Satan. Uh, or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? Uh, that's uh, 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18 we're reading. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Wow. None, right? The answer to the question is, there is no agreement. The temple of God has no agreement with the idols. And the church should have no agreement with idols. If you see something that is obviously an idol, then you need to turn away. For you, look at this, you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. They shall be my people. When you read the Old Testament... There's a lot of emphasis on the tabernacle. And then you get into, remember Solomon built this beautiful temple. And David, um, uh, David gave him, uh, actually he wanted to build the temple, but he said, no, it's not for you, but my son will build my temple. Prophetically, God was talking about Jesus. Jesus will, bring, will build the actual temple. In the, in the epistle of Peter, the apostle Peter tells us that we are living stones in the temple that Jesus built, praise God. And that temple has no, nothing to do with idols. No agreement with, is the temple of God with idols. For you are the temple of living God, praise God. Um, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my, my people. As long as you are upon this earth, never forget, God has promised never to leave you or forsake you even till the end. He says, I will dwell in them and walk in them and be their God, and they shall be my people. And he says, wherefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What does he say in there? Repent, right? If you find yourself in this, repent. And, and I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's one more, 2 Corinthians ch uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, these were all promises. There's lots of promises in the book. We have these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We've read this one before. And uh, Revelation 18, 2, he said, uh, crowd, uh, an angel cried mightily with a strong uh, voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, become a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Remember we talked about how that it's speaking about demons um, in, within, within the church. And uh, here's uh, uh, once again about Babylon the Great. Uh, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All nations, all, all nations. Everybody's been affected. The whole earth has been affected by this, uh, this false church. And the king of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven. This is the scripture that got me out of that. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. How many want to receive of her plagues and be a partaker of her, her judgment, not me? And that's why we need to come out. 
Back to Thyatira. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put no, uh, upon you none other burden. Uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a uh, there's a certain people that are involved in that whole process on the inside. They know a lot more than we know about what's going on. They, they're knowing that what he's talking about, the depths of Satan. He says, if you're on the outside, he's not holding you accountable. Just come out. He's not going to hold you accountable if you're in there, if you come out. Just repent, get out of there. Uh, he says, I will put no other burden upon you, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. Notice here's a mention of his actual coming. The Lord is coming, and that is hope. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nation. Notice, even to this terrible, terrible church that has, um, uh, church dispensation that has had all these things that we look at, who suffered the teachings of the spirit of Jezebel, he even says, if they repent and they keep his works to the end, he will give them power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. Notice, he says, even as I received from my father, then I'm going to give it to you. That's what he's promised me. And and and, or, or us. and then he says, I will give him the morning star. The morning star is Jesus. And I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. He reminds us, these words that I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the churches. Some people have this teaching and attitude that if you're in the church, you, 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 you're uh, completely free of this judgment. You're comp like pr completely free of any responsibility. And you're not because he said he sent the angel to testify to the churches concerning these things. Then he, then he says, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Notice, he says, I'm going to give you the morning star. And then later on, he says that he is the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Uh, just a reminder, we said that there is this, this Jezebel, this spirit of Jezebel. Uh, this, this spirit exists I've called her Lamia. I've called her Lilith. The Bible calls her Lamia. If you're looking at the Latin version, but if you're looking at the at the Hebrew, it's the word is Lilith. The spirit exists. We mentioned before. This is Jezebel was a, a literal person in the Old Testament and literal person in the New Testament. A spirit essence also, and the spirit of Jezebel affects and has infected and affects the church to this day. We're going to go through in the next slide a list of what this Jezebel spirit is. Now, as we go through this list, and I'm not going to get really into it a lot, but I'm just going to read these things, and I want you to, um, to just think about Think about the things that we're going to list here, and you'll, I, I believe the Lord will, will show, He will bring to your mind things that you have witnessed yourself which goes back to the spirit of Jezebel working in the church. Here's, here's some of the things. And all this comes from, uh, how many have heard of deliverance church? Churches that stress, they stress and focus upon deliverance. Deliverance from demonic oppression. Uh, so here's, here's some of the things. They, here's Jezebel. She seeks out other individuals they feel are weaker to control. They influence and dominate them. Uh, she has an unnatural sense of self-importance. She requires excessive admiration and attention, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes, and lacks self-control, unable to control emotional outbursts, unconcerned with the affecting of others, exploitative, uh, abusive, takes advantage of others to achieve her own goals, uh, notice it says his or her because uh, we mentioned this before. The Jezebel spirit can work in a man. It's not just a woman thing. Jezebel, uh, the spirits are really, they're sexless. You know, they, uh, uh, they can masquerade as female or male. They can affect female or male. So when we say Jezebel, it's not just we're, you know, we're poking on uh, uh, or against women. 
This spirit, the spirit is actually sexless, but she manifests herself, uh, seems to manifest herself a lot more in women um, than in men, but it, it, uh, it's prevalent throughout men as well. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been through some of these, these um, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, deliverance services, and uh, I, I can attest to Jezebel is one of the spirits that, that is um, that causes a lot, a lot of trouble in both sexes. But um, she's totally void of empathy, but she'll falsely mimic empathy to seduce and control uh, her victims. Uh, she takes it, uh, the one above that, she takes advantage of others to achieve her own goals. She's manipulative. She lies. She's jealous and envious of others, yet she's delusional in believing others are jealous and envious of her. <clears throat> uh, um, d- defensive and combative whenever confronted about anything. You want to get somebody, somebody with a Jezebel spirit upset, start talking about Jezebel. Say, you know what? You're working, you know, you, you seem to be allowing Jezebel to influence you. That, that'll bring up Jezebel right to the surface. And, um, and people do not like, uh, when, when it's pointed out. And yet, you know, we're, we're all, we're all human. And this, these spirits, these type of spirits, they're out there. And, you know, if someone can ha- even, uh, someone close to us in the church, they can help us and say, you know what, you're, you're not working under the Holy Spirit here. Instead of reacting negatively, we ought to say, well, pray with me and let's get rid of this thing. We need to be honest with ourselves. Get rid of anything that is opposing uh, Christianity and, and true Christianity and, and Christian spirit, Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to get rid of. She's defensive and combative whenever confronted about anything. Uh, she fantasizes uh, about herself having unlimited admiration, beauty, power, success, brilliance, perfected worship and love. She believes that uh, she is superior and unique and can only be understood by other superior people. She has a sense of entitlement. She demands automatic compliance with her expectations. She's unreasonable. She has unreasonable expectations of others. And she's very critical uh, when she's disappointed. Now, I know I went through this fast. Uh, You can, all this is on YouTube. You can go back over. You'll have the notes as well next week. Uh, you'll, you can go through this list. You can think, meditate more upon it. But this kind of defines this Jezebel spirit. And the more you look at it, the more you'll realize that uh, it's very, it's very, very prevalent. This is one of the worst things prevalent in the church. I'm sure pastor has has uh, run up against this many times. Every pastor has run up against this in the church, both working in male. And female. Like I said, we don't want to spend a whole lot of time with it, but I wanted to bring it out because Jezebel is much more than a person. It's much more than limiting it to, you know, this part thing about Thyatira. It, uh, it's a whole spirit evilness. It likes um, conflict. Likes split. conflict, likes the split. Yeah. How do you fight back against that when you feel like you're under that person's thought? How do you fight back? Prayer. Well, yeah, I, I agree, definitely wow. prayer. But th- this is the thing, because we have faced this, this spirit before. Um, what happened in our church in Crandon is that people, rec- one, recognized that they knew that the spirit was trying to divide, that it was spreading lies, rumors. It was, it was underlining what God was doing there. And the, the mature Christians, women, especially in the church, rose up. And so when they started saying things or doing things, they would they would confront them, confront this girl. And uh, as they did that, um, she really was on her own. So you have to isolate them. Yes. You cannot let them. If somebody came in here and started a fight, we'd isolate them. They are no longer. They they have come against the body, and they've isolated themselves. And, and then we watch. You know, uh, we never ask this person. They, they usually have a way of getting rid of themselves because nobody will follow them. Nobody will uh, because they want to take the attention onto themselves. They want the power. They want the authority. They want to have the say. So you basically snip, 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 yes, snip. Yes, you have to do. And this is the beginning of it. This is how you. The way you do it is you. You. What we just did. 
We just announced, we just taught, this is out there, and by just by educating people, most of Christians do want to do right. That's right. And so when it's, and, and uh, you have leadership, you have government in the church, you have leadership in the church for reasons such as this. There's a reason things are set up. And uh, for instance, uh, where I, I, I've, uh, I've seen where people have certain gifts in the spirit. A lot of times what, what ha- uh, you see abuses in tongues, delivering of messages, and, and uh, inappropriately. There's times to do that, and there's times not to do it. For instance, when the pastor's preaching a message, that's not the time 15 minutes after his message for you to stand up and, and start speaking in tongues. That's not that's not what kosher, so to speak, and that that just that blows everything away. Uh, it's improper. Uh, another thing is um, you don't. Uh, it's Jezebel when Jezebel confronts the pastor and uh, tries to, uh, uh, like you mentioned, isolate but undermine the pastor and try to get people on her side. But pastor's right. If you if you go ahead, if you educate your people. If you teach them that this exists, and then when it happens, people know what's going on, and you you break the branches, the ten the tentacles, and that person will either repent or they'll leave. They'll leave. That's right. And so, of course, if we have this, we want to deal with in love, and we want we want to we want to go visit, and it is a very serious, right? But it can be very harmful. They think they're right. They do. That's yes. They don't want to budge on what you're saying. And I've had people come back and apologize to me at times. But but usually they will not because they're right and you're wrong and you're wrong. And, and after a while, I, I've confronted them and said, wait a minute. So so far, this person's wrong, this person's wrong, this person. And I go down the list. I said, do you realize that everybody is wrong and you're the only one that's right? In other words... They're not all the problem. I don't have a problem with this person, this person, this one. All these people you just said were a problem in the church. I don't have a problem with them. The problem is you. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? And you have to confront those spirits at times. And uh, they, they, like you said, they'll usually leave on their own. But there's times that you have to confront them. And I, I've had to several times. And not just women, men also. And there, church is not a place where everybody's you're supposed to come and you're supposed to be on the stage to to get everybody to get all this glory for yourself. They want people to follow them. exactly, follow them. exactly. Don't follow me. Follow Christ, like Ron says. A- absolutely. The Bible, but they will want you to follow them rather than yes, sir. Christ. Oh, t- yeah, yeah. Terrors, yeah, yeah. This Jezebel thing, oh my gosh, you just described like every woman I've ever dated. Well, it. Oh, you poor baby. Outside of the church, it's very prevalent. Yes. In corporations, it's very prevalent. Yes. In this society, especially the American, um, I would say the American northern parts of the country. It, it's so terrible. Why Why north versus south? Because the south is more the Bible Belt. They don't want to submit. They don't want to be under uh, exactly. a husband. And I'm not saying to rule exactly. over them. I'll tell you, you tell them what to do. And man, you, you got a spear. That, that you, you're in a but you got, this, you, got the same, you're in a you got the same thing in males as you got with yes. females. But uh, if you, <laughs> if you uh, did I pick up on every kind of uh, so, you know what, I don't want to, I, I want to go forward now. I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, if pastor wants to deal more with it on Sunday morning and expose the whole church to it, maybe we'll even have a, 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 a <laughs> deliverance session and get rid of it. But uh, I'm just, exp- this is what it is, okay? This is, it's there, or I shouldn't say it, she's there. I call her a she. Um, her name's feminine, Jezebel. But uh, I think George mentioned, uh, when you think the synonymous, Jezebel, witch. Yeah. Okay? Sometimes, and, and in Pentecostal churches, yeah. Pentecostal churches attract witches. Uh-huh. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. You, you know, Baptist church doesn't attract a witch. 
But a, char- a charismatic or a Pentecostal church does. But they also know how to deal with them. And, and you have to know how to deal. There's when when you when you when you're in a Pentecostal or Charismatic church, you believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but not everything that's done in the Spirit is the right Spirit. And so what happens is you're 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 giving some freedom for people to to move in the Spirit, and you're inviting uh, confusion and chaos. Let's go on though. Uh, next slide. One thing, Brother Ron, it says test the spirit. Test the spirits. Test Praise them. God. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I, like I promised, we're going to jump into Sardis now. And, you know, if, if, if uh, Thyatira spoke a lot about Catholicism, then, you know, the natural, uh, the natural place then, or the natural next step would be the Reformation. And what you see here is um, the Reformation was... Between 1520, 1750 A.D., and some of these people you may you may recognize some of these names, some of the others you may not. Um, uh, some of the uh, more uh, popular ones is probably Wycliffe, uh, definitely Martin Luther. Uh, most people, when they say when you say Reformation, they think Martin Luther. He's credited with the Reformation, but he was not the only one, and it began way before him. Uh, John Wesley. John Calvin, uh, John Knox, who my wife is actually a re- uh, related to, uh, Knox, uh, Roger Williams, and um, you know, if you want to, a lot of their materials that the people to this day, uh, true Bible believing Christians, still feed off a lot of the things that they wrote. These men were uh, were gifted. Gifted teachers, they were very wise in the word. A lot of the things they produced were good. The problem was uh, there was no, there was not enough follow through upon their uh, Christian descendants. Um, a lot of these, had, a lot of the things that they accomplished, uh, bringing the word to us, uh, bringing truth to us, good stuff, good stuff. But it, unfortunately, like I said. Not enough follow through in in our generation. So let's read the scripture here. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right? Now Sardis, the name actually comes. Have you? How many have heard of the Sardis stone? That was actually one of the stones in the uh, the breastplate of the high priest, and it, it was the firstborn stone. It was Reuben's stone. So uh, that's kind of an, it was like a blood red stone, and it was it was really rare, and we'll get into that in a little while. But so unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. Re- remember what the seven spirits and the seven stars were? The church, the church, and the angels of the church. Remember, there's seven churches. Um, I know thy works. That thou hast the name that thou livest. Look at he's talking. Think about it. He's talking to the churches of the Reformation. He says, "You have a name that you live." Now look at this, and you're dead. You're dead. He never even said that to Thyatira. With all the stuff about Thyatira that we looked at and the, the controlling spirit and the apparition, apparitions and the uh, Lilith control and Jezebel's control, and yet to this church he said, he said, you have a name that you live, and yet you're dead. So it must be a time frame here. They started out. I just got through uh, 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 saying that there was a great, great teachers. And people use their teachings today. Remarkable movement of the Holy Spirit. And yet the scripture says, Thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Is he talking to the church today? I think so. I think the churches that are very close to these reformers and go by their names, I think he's, the Spirit is saying you need to be watchful. What is watchful? Watchful. What do we watch for? We watch for the coming of the Lord. Do you know a lot of the offspring of these reformed churches? They're not watching for the coming of the Lord. They're not watching. You know what happens if you don't watch? You don't go. 
He said, be watchful. Now you need to strengthen the things which remain. So there's good stuff there, but look at it. But they're ready to die. He said, the things that the, these, these godly men uh, came forth and, and, and brought much truth during the Reformation, he said, you're, you're about letting them die. I have not found thy works perfect before God. Are we speaking about everybody? No. When you look at the churches, you're never speaking about 100%. There's always a remnant inside every one of these dispensations. Whenever there's chastisement, whenever there's rebuke, there's also people who are strong believers, who are truthful uh, t- believers. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received... Hmm. What if they? What if the churches that came out of the Reformation, and we're talking about a lot of organized church, what if they remembered how they received the truths that they that they got? But a lot of them are just going, you know, lackadaisical through the world, and and they they've uh, a, you, they don't even teach what their founders taught, and uh, hold fast and repent. If you shall not watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. What do you think he's talking about? The rapture. He's telling these church church people, he says, if you're not watching for my return. You say you believe, but you're not watching. And if you don't watch, I will come on you like a thief. What does that mean? If he comes on you like a thief, you won't see it coming. He'll come, get his church, he'll leave, and you'll still be wondering what happened. That's it. How many heard of that? Uh, There was a movie years ago called uh, The Thief in the Night. Talked about the coming of the Lord and leaving. There's there's a doctrine that that, uh, teaches that, um, that everyone in the church is going into rapture. Because they're all part of the body. That's not true. In fact, we see it right here. We saw it in the previous one, and this is why I went over. In the previous dispensation, we said, Jesus actually said, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of you into the tribulation if you don't repent. To this church, he says, you're dead. You're dead. You repent, watch, strengthen what remains, because I'm going to come and it's going to be like a thief and you're going to be left. Behind is what he's saying here. You will not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names. See, here's the remnant. You have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Praise God. There's always a, there's always a people that are worthy. The part I highlighted, I love this part. He says, you have a few names, even in your church, <laughs> even in Sardis. Believe it or not, there's a few, even where, even in your church, <laughs> that are good. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Do you notice what that scripture there tells me is that your name is ever, all of us who have been born on this earth, our name is in the book of life. Amen. We got to do something to get it blotted out. Yeah. Yeah. And what most of us do to get it blotted out is when the gospel comes to us, we, we reject it. Yeah. That's, that's blotting it out right there. He said, but I, he said, I won't blot out. He said, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life for the overcomer, and he shall uh, be clothed in white raiment. And then he says, um, I'll, I'll confess his name before my father, before his angels. Aren't you glad that the father knows your name and that the angels of God knows your name? Praise God. That's a big deal. And then he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. That's kind of a trademark uh, saying for Jesus, isn't it? So now we're gonna we're gonna try to uh, go through a, a little uh, history of Sardis to find out what does this church period what, what does it really represent? And uh, uh, you know he talks about 
Um, if you don't watch, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna be basically saying you're gonna be taken by surprise, right? And it's very, the, 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 uh, the name Sardis equates with this idea of being taken by surprise. And so we're gonna look at that. Um, uh, say, Sardis was the capital of, um, the, um, uh, uh, Empire of Lydia, 549 B.C. It was one of the most ancient cities of renown and at least as far back as 2000 B.C. So it's a, existed a long time. It was famous for King Midas. Who, how many have heard of King Midas? Everything he touched turned to God. Now, I am not saying that that was true. That King Midas is not in the Bible. It is mythology, but there was something to it. The Greeks explain, what they were doing is explaining how did this guy get so wealthy, all right? I don't believe that this guy actually had this. I, I, I guess it's possible. I, I guess uh, some strong occult influencers, I guess it's possible, uh, but I don't, I don't think that it was true. But anyway, um, it, it, Sardis was famous for King Midas. Um, the uh, Phrygians, which was the um, the uh, empire there that uh, had uh, control of Sardis as a city, the Phrygians were dominant, uh, the dominant Anatolian power in Asia Minor. What that Anatolia w- w- was uh, uh, basically Turkey. Uh, King, Mi- and you remember that seven churches are located in Turkey. Okay, King Midas, the King Midas, and I even have there on there a myth. Okay, so don't you know, I don't want you to think that uh, we're talking about some character in an Old Testament. But King Midas had the power to change anything he touched to gold. The problem, of course, was when he went to eat, right? He touched his daughter. He, 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 he touched his daughter. And but but even before that, he he went to eat. He touched an apple. The apple turns into gold. You can't eat gold, right? So uh, it was a bad deal. But the, um, how many heard of Cyrus, King Cyrus? Cyrus comes out of the Bible, right? Well, per, the Persian king Cyrus marched against his brother Art, 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 Artaxerxes, and it was at this place, uh, Sardis. So both Artaxerxes and uh, Cyrus are both mentioned in the scripture. And it's right around the time of Daniel, right uh, as Daniel, almost almost at the end of Daniel's life. But uh, the city of Sardis was known for its impenetrable security, and we're going to look at that in a minute. So, but it was well known that and believed by the people that lived there that they were completely safe from any invaders. And this is the attitude of a lot of these churches out there that fit this description of the Sardis dispensation. You try to bring the word to them, and they think they're safe. Satan can't get them. Satan can't touch them. And they don't need your warning. They don't need the word. They feel they're safe. But they're not safe. They're just like Sardis. And they can be uh, invaded. The city of Sardis was known... I already said, Sardis was built 1,500 feet above the valley floor on a spur that jutted out from one of the surrounding mountains. And we're going to see actually a picture of where it was located and how it was impregnable uh, to its enemies. Um, We already said he was famous for King Midas. Um, uh, Oh, you you see uh, on the next slide here, remember the statue there? Um, a Sibylle or a Sibel or how, however you say it. Sibylle, I think maybe. Um, but we've talked about her before uh, throughout that when we when we uh, were t- teaching about the, um, she was the main goddess of Sardis, and um, and her son was that Dionysus, which is the one who supposedly gave the um, the gift to King Midas. Next slide shows us the ancient. Uh, um, uh, Territory of Lydia, the the um, empire of Lydia there, and you can see Smyrna, Sardis, Ephesus. There's three of the seven churches right real close to each other, and engulfed there in Lydia. And uh, you, you'll notice the name Thrace, Thracia, up there t- uh, to the northeast, and also Troy. How many have heard of Troy? Troy, you know, they had a movie about Troy, right? Um, which was very popular. You can see here on the next slide, if you if you go all the way to the right, almost up to yeah, the north there, you can see Phrygia. 
And so you can see where that was. You can see Troy here as well. Um, I don't see any of the other uh, the churches here. You can see Thrace up there way to the north, the north uh, east there. So it uh, gives you a little background of, of where it was actually located historically. Um, you can see here that it was um, uh, uh, Sardis was strategically located between Pergamus, Smyrna, Ephesus, Philadelphia, and Phrygia. So it was favor it had favorable commerce, and it became a very wealthy city. You can see the wealth. So you can see maybe where this idea of Midas and everything turning to go. They were very wealthy because of where they were situated. They were at the center of commerce. Um, they were uh, uh, they became very wealthy, and there was gold found in the sand in the river Pactus, and uh, gold. And they were the first ones to make gold and silver coins. Uh, they were called Lydian staters. Okay? Uh, at its zenith, both King uh, Croesus as well as the river Pactus became proverbial for its riches. Now, now we're going to find out, well, how did the gold get into the river? Uh, the way the story goes is King Midas in Greek mythology was the king of Phrygia and uh, in uh, or, uh, in Asia Minor, and he showed hospitality to a drunken satyr, uh, Selenius, and as a result, the god Dionysus, which you see at the bottom here, he's got the uh, the grapes and the wine, he was the god of wine, he offered to grant Midas anything he wished. By the way, the worship of Dionysus was uh, drunken orgies. Okay, so uh, that was a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, followed after that guy, but um, he offered to grant Midas anything he wished because of his generosity to the satyr, and so that's the way the myth goes. And so obviously we know he wished that everything he touched would be turned into gold, and so even his food and his water, as George brought up, even he touched his child, and his child turns into gold. He was unable to eat. Um, so he wanted to free himself from the enchantment. So to free himself, Midas was instructed by this god Dionysus to bathe in the Pactolus River. And uh, it was said afterwards that the sand of the river contained gold. So the gold, uh, the um, enchantment came off of him into the, into the water, which the gold then went into the sand. So that's how they explain where all this gold came from. So not only was the place lo Sardis was located right in the middle of all the commerce, but then they discovered all this gold. Enough so that they made the gold and the silver coins and, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to talk about the Sardis stone. Uh, so uh, the Sardis stone, now here, this is kind of interesting about the Sardis stone. Nobody is a hundred, first you can see the 12, uh, picture of the, there were 12 stones on the, um, uh, what do you call it on the on the high priest here, uh, on the chest of his high on the high priest, and each stone represented one of the tribes of Israel, and like we said, the Sardius stone was the stone of Reuben, and uh, but nobody is a hundred percent sure what the Sardius stone was. However, like uh, uh, like George said, it was blood red. Uh, it was, however, it was once considered to be a precious stone. It was considered rare and valuable. Now, keep this in mind: the church dispensation is in this church is called Sardis, right? It's named after this stone. Now, look what it's saying. Look what we're seeing: the stone itself was once considered to be extremely precious and rare and valuable. So by type, this all of these uh, all of these leaders in the Reformation, they were they have been considered by most of the at least the Protestant church, they were considered to be rare and valuable and their teachings precious, right? But this once precious and rare stone became common over the years, and it completely lost its value. Yeah. Is, is that a ruby? Is it, stone? it was not a ruby. You know that that's kind of good though, Ruba, Ruben, and ruby. Yeah, but it was not a ruby. They made it very clear that it was not a ruby. Um, but it, it, it is interesting how, um, like I mentioned, that for years and years and years, in fact. 
Anybody that even even goes to, to seminary today and studies theology, they'll actually look and, and pull up some of these um, writings of these you know these founders of the Reformation, these leaders of the Reformation. Their writings are still gold. But you know, even though they're rare in the mind of some people and desired, for the people that are in those churches, they could care less about anything that they wrote. They don't follow the doctrines anymore. They don't follow the teachings anymore. They kind of wing it, you know. Church is not about winging it. it. And people have the same attitude about the Bible. If you want to know the truth, if you want to be a Christian, you need to go back to what the apostles wrote. You can't, you, there's never a place to toss away the New Testament writings. That's right. And I'll go one step further, because this is a major problem that the church has faced. Even the church of God, sadly, they, they, they not only want to tr- throw away the New Testament, but even if they embrace the New Testament, they want to throw away the Old. It's all the Word of God. And I'll tell you, as being someone who has studied the Bible quite a bit, not as much as I would like, but quite a bit in my life, I have discovered that if you don't have an understanding of the Old Testament, you're going to have a weak understanding of the New Testament. So it's all the Word of God. You need to, this is why they don't understand. This is why they don't, they don't have the foundation because they, uh, they look upon the Word of God in the words of the founders. And, um, and the things that God brought. Remember he said, remember how you have received? That's what he told the church. Remember how you have received what you have. It's valuable. But they disregard it. Now here you can see the, the uh, Mount uh, T- Tamales um, in the background. And you can, you, you can see it um, uh, how it, you could only access it from one side. You see that? The city of Sardis was actually built at the top of the hill, or top of the mountain. So you could see how it was impregnable, because you you only had to guard one side. And the, the enemy couldn't, or invader couldn't, actually, we say ostensibly impregnable, because it looks like it's impregnable. It looks like it's a fortress. It looks like there's no way to take them by surprise. But see, it's all about looks. And this fits this dispensation in this church period. It's all about looks. But there's no depth. Uh, The city of Sardis was built upon this mountain. It was ostensibly impregnable. Apparently, it was purported to be outwardly secure from invaders. Sardis was situated on the northern slope of Mount uh, Timolus on a hill 950 feet above the broad valley of Hermas. The sheer precipitous cliff was made of clay and suffered continual erosion. This left the mud on the cliff exposed to occasional cracks, which was later discovered could be exploited by their enemies. So because of the natural erosion, what appeared in the minds of the people to be safe was only in their minds. This is why Jesus said, if you don't watch, you're going to be taken. You're going to, it's going to be like a thief in the night. 549 B.C., uh, King Croesus, king of Lydia, left his fortress completely unguarded from the attacking Persians led by the biblical Cyrus on three sides. Now, this is how it happened. It uh, gives us some detail. Uh, king Cyrus, he was wondering, how can he take this city? Because he looked at it, uh, he was a uh, he could not figure out strategically how he can um, uh, attack and, and uh, conquer the city. The king was uh, was he felt safe that nobody could get up from any side except for coming straight at him. So that was uh, defective on his defective thinking on his part. So Cyrus said, okay, how, I, I need to figure out how I can invade this place. So he offered a reward to any man who could find a way of scaling the cliff to ultimately achieve him in conquering the city of Sardis. One of the soldiers noticed at Lydian, a Lydian soldier accidentally dropped his helmet and took note of the path the soldier took to retrieve his helmet. At night, the Persian king successively penetrated the unguarded city, uh, the side of the city. In other words, what happened is the soldier dropped his something 
so simple. A soldier dropped his helmet and somebody watched it and watched the soldier walk down the cliff. Because remember, the clay eroded and there was a path. And they could walk down the cliff. And he saw how that happened. He reported it to Cyrus. And they were able to use the same thing at night, uh, same idea at night, and uh, invade the country. So uh, the Sardians did not learn their lesson from this conquest and the invulnerability of the cliff, which they thought kept them safe from invasion. Once again, what speaks of the Sardis dispensation? They think they're safe. I don't need the word. I don't need your warnings. I don't need biblical prophecy. I'm safe. I'm a this. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm this denomination or I'm this denomination. I don't need the Bible. Uh, in 214 BC, once again, Lagoras the Cretan implemented his similar strategy, repeated the invasion when the city was once again taken by Antiochus III for the Seleucid Empire. We brought up the Seleucid Empire before. Uh, that, that was, um, the king of the north in the, in the book of Daniel, actually. We talked, we talked about the, the Seleucid Empire and we had maps up there in previous, um, previous lessons. But uh, you'll see that what happened, happened again. The, the people, you know, after centuries, they thought they were impregnable. And once again, they were invaded. Here's the thing about Christianity. When you think you're safe, think again. That's right. The devil is out there to seek who he can kill, steal, destroy, and devour. He's out there. There's nothing you can do. He's not going away. Not going away until you leave. That's when you're safe, when you're up there. You're not, see it. you're not safe until the trumpet blows and your feet are off this earth and you find yourself in heaven. That's when you can take a, a breath, of a sigh of relief, praise God. Um, interesting, uh, you've probably heard, uh, heard this, but uh, there's a, one who wrote about, uh, his name Hegel, said, history teaches that man learns nothing from history. Interesting quote. And then Edmund Burke said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> right? You know what's funny? Is that uh, we find ourselves uh, over and over and over and over in this country making the same mistakes. You know, you had World War I, but then you had World War II. Who caused World War I in the first place? Germany. Who caused World War II? Germany. Who's going to cause World War Three? Germany. The Germans are the problem. The Germans are. But, uh, you know, we don't learn. We just, we don't learn from history. Um, the fate, look at this. Look how many times this, is, this fell. Uh, the fate of Sardis being taken by surprise was pre repeated over and over and over. And this is, this is what the message of the Spirit is saying to this church. He's saying, you're going to be taken by surprise. You need to watch. Or it'll come upon you and you won't know it. See, in 549, it fell to the Persians. In 501, it was burned by the Ionians and an ancient Hellenic people. Hellenic is Greece. Uh, 334, it was uh, surrendered to Alexander the Great. In 322, it was taken by a Macedonian general and Antigonus uh, under Alexander the Great. And in 214, it fell to the Seleucids. So... They, they always had this false sense of security, and yet their own history taught them over and over and over and over and over again that they weren't safe. Uh, Sardis, uh, Sardis, as well as some of these other um, uh, of the seven churches, were almost completely destroyed by an earthquake in 17 AD, which... Uh, it just says expectantly, I imagine what I meant there was unexpectedly came upon the city. Um, it was destroyed again uh, in 1402 by the Turkish Empire. Uh, Sardis is known as a city of failure or failures. Well, let's, let's uh, associate that with the name Sardis and this church dispensation. And look what we have here. The name Sardis became synonymous with pretensions unjustified, a promise without performance, the appearance without reality, false confidence that heralded ruin, and they betrayed themselves 
by the lack of watchfulness and diligence. You see that? They betrayed themselves. It's not that Satan betrayed. They, they did it to themselves with a false sense of security. And Christians do this today. There are Sardis Christians out there. There's Sardis, there's whole churches that are Sardis churches, but there's Sardis Christians everywhere. In fact, as we go through these seven churches, just because you're in a particular denomination or a particular church, that doesn't mean that, not, that some of this stuff is not relevant to you. We have people from every one of these dispensations in the church today. A false sense of security, and they cause their own problems by not being watchful, not being diligent, and that they betray themselves. Um, how many have heard of the Gutenberg uh, Press? This became very, uh, very Im- uh, important uh, during this time of the Reformation. Probably if it wasn't so much for the invention of the press, the, uh, the Reformation may not even have been successful. Remember, they were up against the papacy, right? The mo- and, and that's what we have there on the right as, as well, the movable type. Um, so the invention of uh, printing with, with movable type there, uh, the Gutenberg Bible was the first book printed. How many heard about the Gutenberg Bible? It's famous because it's the first thing they printed on the press. Can you imagine that happening today with all our technology? Is anybody uh, uh, looking to technology so that they can further the gospel? But you know what? Think about it. Why do we have jet planes? I believe we have jet planes so we can send missionaries out. Why, you, why do we have internet? We have internet so I can put these messages on YouTube. Everything that God gets, why do we have automobiles? So we can get to church. There's no way I can come to church on Sunday at this church from where I live. Even if I had horse and buggy, it'd take me a long time to get here. I'd have to stop several times just to go to the bathroom. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, this Gutenberg press and the movable type, it fueled the Reformation in Germany. Remember, a lot of these leaders wrote a lot of, of solid uh, scholarly uh, uh, doctrinal uh, books and studies. Uh, the scholarly studies laid the basis on which Luther and Calvin and the other reformers claimed the Bible rather than the church as the sole authority. This gave them the power to uh, dispense their teaching and their, um, their very scholarly studies and to convince people to, uh, uh, to, to protest against Catholicism. Catholics waged wars against the Protestants. There was war on the German Protestants in 1566-1609. There was war on the Netherlands Protestants the same time period. There was war on the Huguenot Protestants in France from 1572 to 1598. Um, King Philip had war against England Protestants at uh, 1588. And afterwards there was another 30 years of war Catholics against Protestants just went on and on and on because Catholicism tried to stamp out the Reformation. Incidentally, do you know who came to the help of the Reformers? For one thing, the kings of Europe were tired of the, <laughs> the papacy taking advantage of and ruling over a lot, a lot of them, did, so they came to the help of the Reformers. But also the Muslims. The Muslims actually, when they were fighting against the papacy, remember that you had the Crusades? And that kind of ticked off. They, they just kept going back and forth, going back and forth. So the Muslims actually uh, uh, supplied some help to the Reformation. And uh, it's almost uh, interesting the way God, God did that. Uh, uh, when we say Reformation, we think about Martin Luther. Martin Luther was born in 1483 uh, to a coal miner, and he decided to become a lawyer. Now, if he, if he kept his ambition to become a lawyer, we never would have had Lutheranism. We never would have had all the books of, uh, that Luther, uh, Luther had. But in 1504, there was this violent storm, and that changed his course to, per, to uh, pursue a doctorate of theology. So if it wasn't for this storm, violent storm, that obviously scared the Dickens out of him, uh, he wouldn't have uh, went into theology. Um, 
We've probably all heard the story of how Martin Luther, he was a Catholic monk, right? And he went, he was, he was disillusioned with the papacy. And, uh, and we see that up there on the slide here, Luther uh, nailed his 95 thesis to the door at Wittenberg. The thing that we remember uh, so much about Luther is he realized, I believe when he, he was, he's climbing up the steps at the Vatican, he's climbing up the steps on his knees, and his knees were bloody, and he got, and all of a sudden he hears the Spirit of God say this scripture to him, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in me, but the just shall live by his faith. This was the big scripture that got a hold of Martin Luther, the just shall live by, it's not by your works, not by your power, but by my Spirit says the Lord, right? And if anything spoke of Martin Luther, it was the just shall live by faith. And it gave him the uh, the uh, the power to, to stand against the papacy and um, and to say we're not going to keep the the rules and the uh, there is no authority at Rome. They have no jurisdiction over us. We are children of God and the only one who we need to give an account to is God alone. 